When I was running shadow super high one night on my suit up chair with a four nine. Cops can't catch me cause I'm the king of the blue shine here but he's running around. Hi, I'm Anthony Fisher with Reason TV, and we're here with Jamie Joyce, the author of Moonshine, A Cultural History of America's Infamous Liquor. Jamie, thanks so much for joining thanks us. Thanks for having me. A lot of people think of moonshine as like Prohibition-era bathtub liquor, and now it's popular yeah. with the Brooklyn hipster set. Mm -hmm. What exactly is moonshine? Moonshine is a clear, unaged whiskey. Generally, it's made from corn, although it's been used, but people will use anything that ferments. You know, historically, they've used just about anything. But generally, it's been corn. Um, it's also been barley, it's also been rye, so a grain that's steeped, unaged. A lot of times people will call moonshine whiskey without the wood or bourbon without the barrel. Where did moonshine originate? And it's always kind of been associated with law breaking. Can you like separate some of the myths from the reality? Yeah, moonshining has a long history in the United States. It came with settlers from, from Europe, you know, the Ulster region. Um, a lot of these- Ulster Scot in Northern Ireland. Yes, so you had a lot of the Scots-Irish coming to this country, bringing these traditions with them. And many of them settled in western Pennsylvania. And so you had a real um, movement going on there where, and we can't really call it moonshining at the time because it was legal to make this whiskey, but it was this was before a time that it was taxed. So when the government in 1791 Put the uh, impose the distilled spirits tax. Then we started to get people who were saying, oh, "Hey, wait a second! This is not cool. What are you trying to do?" We're talking about the colonial eras, and yeah. you know, a big part of uh, the protests against the British is that the new Americans thought they wouldn't have to deal with this kind of stuff anymore. Can you talk a little bit about the whiskey rebellion? Yeah, the whiskey rebellion. I think it it came about because suddenly we we've just had the Revolutionary War, and then you had the Secretary of the Treasury saying, "Hey, we." Alexander Hamilton saying we need to finance, we need to pay for the Revolutionary War debt. In order to do that, we're going to impose a tax on distilled spirits. So this was something that people were very uncomfortable with. This was something where we had just fought a war of independence against unfair taxes. And, and, and so suddenly to have the United States government trying to impose this tax. People felt this was very unfair. And so there were organized protests largely in western Pennsylvania. And this is where the Whiskey Rebellion grew out of. And so you had groups of what they, they were being called insurgents by the federal <laughs> government. Um, yes, <laughs> they, these were these, insurgents. Yeah, names, yeah, the names these stick names around stick. in different contexts. So these insurgents were going after tax collectors. Um, and it became a violent rebellion, ultimately in which you had uh, President Washington sent out nearly 13,000 troops to quell this rebellion, and he himself led that charge out to Pennsylvania. Moving forward a little, sure. uh, prohibition ended in the 30s, but then there was more prohibition of moonshine itself. Can you talk a little bit about that? You know, after prohibition, a lot of times people think, well, suddenly the nation could drink again. Well, that's not entirely true. There were still many places throughout this country, and there are still places today that are dry. So in some states, we even have dry counties, wet counties, and within a dry county, wet cities, you know? So there's this real um, holdover or a hangover, perhaps, from Prohibition. So still, you, ha you had these communities where this was making this clear unaged whiskey, liquor. This was also part of cultural heritage. This wasn't just a way to make money, although it was a very good way for many people to make money. And people it was very prominent in Appalachia. Absolutely, very prominent in Appalachia. But because liquor was still expensive, because jobs were scarce, we were leading into the Great Depression. So there were still people who needed to make money, and they relied on this family tradition of making moonshine. So this was a big economic driver for a lot of people. It kept families afloat. It kept put food on the table. Can you talk a little bit about the struggles for moonshiners yes. trying to go legitimate? Yes. Well, in back in you know, and we're talking in the in the 1800s, the mid to late 1800s, there wasn't really a movement for for moonshiners to go legitimate per se. But they were trying to continue their efforts to make their liquor without being detected by the law. And so it was a real cat and mouse game between revenuers and moonshiners. And revenuers were the revenue agents. And these were federal agents that came into play in the, I believe it was 1861, where we had our first income tax. And t liquor was taxed. And if you weren't paying that tax, 
you could be arrested. And so when you look back at some of the very old, the original IRS tax records, I mean, every year the IRS put out yearly bulletins about their activities. These read like Western novels because you have stories of revenue agents riding on horseback up into these hills and valleys, sniffing out the corn mash in creeks, you know, really using all of their senses. And it was violent. I mean, there were definitely people within these small communities who really, they didn't feel like these moonshiners were doing anything wrong. Can you talk a little bit about how moonshining led to the rise of NASCAR, which is uh, apparently America's most popular spectator sport? All of, you had all these people in the South who were coming up as whiskey trippers. That's what they called the drivers. So they were some of the most skilled drivers around. And so it was just natural that they would become involved in NASCAR. Um, one of the people that I write about in my book, Moonshine, is a man that many people, NASCAR fans, would know, Junior Johnson. And Junior Johnson was one of the first inductees in the NASCAR Hall of Fame. Now, Junior Johnson, as a young man, starting at about age 14, helped his father with his moonshine whiskey business. So he was one of these guys who would go out at 14 years old, pre-driver's license, but he knew how to drive, and he would deliver the liquor to people. So he knew how to drive fast and skillfully because the law was after him all the time. Why is moonshine culturally relevant now? Because we have so many people interested in this do-it-yourself movement, sort of back to these original foods and, and, uh, and drink in, the, in this country. And so it's in order to make something, you know, to make this liquor on your own is really exciting to a lot of people. It's under the radar. It's, it's still against the law. It remains against the law to make distilled spirits, even though wine and beer you can, you can make legally. The title of the book refers to moonshine as America's most infamous liquor. Is there a push for exporting uh, moonshine to the rest of the world? Is there an interest in it? Well, as, as we, um, you know, moonshine has a long history in the United States. And because of that, I think, it has this mystique that I think is appealing to people in other countries. And in fact, I do know that um, the folks at Kings County Distillery in Brooklyn, which is the uh, distillery near m where I live in Brooklyn, um, they're starting to, to export some of their moonshine to Japan. Um, and so there's a real interest in, in American culture, and this is certainly a deep, deep part of American culture. Thanks so much for talking to us. Jamie Joyce, the author of Moonshine, A Cultural History of America's Infamous Liquor for Reason TV. I'm Anthony Fisher.